This is the Exxon Radio TV show with Rob McConnell on the Exxon Broadcast Network and our worldwide family of broadcast affiliates. If you have a question for Rob McConnell or his guest, or if you've had a paranormal experience, call toll-free 1-800-610-7035, extension 0, or email xzone at xzoneradiotv.com. On all social media sites, our one address is xzone radio tv. Named one of the world's greatest psychics, Elizabeth Joyce is now giving readings worldwide via Skype. Elizabeth Joyce is recognized for her clairvoyant ability to help find missing persons, her analysis of dreams, past life regression work, mediumship, and her accurate predictions. Elizabeth has been a frequent guest on the Exxon Radio Show with yours truly, Rob McConnell, now for several years. For an appointment with Elizabeth Joyce, call 201-934-8986 or Skype at elizabeth.joyce. And for more information, you can always visit Elizabeth Joyce online at www.new-visions.com. a disease that you would like to alleviate through a natural means? Have you been contacted by angels, ghosts, or even extraterrestrials and want to validate these experiences? Or would you simply like to speak with someone who can help you find your life's purpose? I'm Dr. Joseph Mara, and I'm offering my services free of charge for first-time clients contacting me during the month of April. These free consultations include angel card readings, guided meditations, life coaching, and energy healing. If you have always wanted to explore these types of experiences but were skeptical or simply could not afford them, then take advantage of this free special offer. Contact me through my website, aguidinglight, spelled L-I-T-E, dot com, to schedule your consultation today. Until then, I offer you love, light, and laughter. You're listening to the X Zone Radio Show live and around the world on the Talk Star Radio Network. Visit us online at www.xzone-radio.com. The X-Zone radio and TV show is largely an opinion talk show. All opinions, comments, or statements of fact expressed by Rob McConnell's guests are strictly their own and are not to be construed as those of the X-Zone radio and TV show or in any manner endorsed by Rob McConnell, Relmar McConnell Media Company, Talkstar Radio Network, its affiliated stations, or employees. Welcome to the X Zone, a place where fact is fiction and fiction is reality. Now, here's your host, Rob McConnell. Hmm. Like the pine trees lining the winding road. I've got a name, I've got a name Like a singing bird in the croaking toad I've got a name, I've got a name And I carry it with me like my daddy did But I'm living the dream that he kept here Rolling me down the highway, moving ahead till life won't pass me by. Like a north wind whistling down the sky. 
Welcome back, everyone. My name is Rob McConnell, and this is the Exxon on the Talk Star Radio Network. My guest this hour is Kevin Randall. He's the author of more than 100 books, including everything from science fiction to murder mysteries to almost 20 books dealing with the paranormal and UFOs. He is a graduate of the University of Iowa, an American military university, and California Coast uh, Coast University with an M.A. in military science and an M.S. and a Ph.D. in psychology. Kevin flew helicopters for the Army in Vietnam and served as an intelligence officer in Iraq. He has studied UFOs for more than 30 years, has lectured on the topic around the country, and is considered to be one of the leading authorities on the topic. And Dr. Kevin Randall, welcome back to the x Always great having you with us, Kevin. Oh, glad to be here. Tell me, Kevin, uh, here we are a couple of weeks after the uh, anniversary of Roswell, and is there anything new pertaining to the Roswell case? Well, there's quite a quite a bit going on, and a lot of it sounds like the minutiae you get to when you look at something very, very closely. But what we've, we've been looking at are some of the criticisms offered by the skeptical community. For example, um, Lydia Schleppe was a secretary in one of the radio stations, and she was on the phone with a reporter who was on the scene looking at the crushed, what he called a crushed dishpan mm-hmm. of, of the flying saucer and relating to her what he had seen. And she was on the teletype machine putting this over the air, and the transmission was interrupted by saying, you know, cease transmission immediately, this is classified material, or something like that. Well, the skeptic said you can't do that. There was no way to interrupt the, um, the, the signal that way. And it turns out, when you, when you go back and you look at the affidavit that Liddy Schleppe had um, signed and some of the interviews, she explained that the interruption was a, a bell would sign sound on the teletype machine, and she would then have to flip the switch from transmit to receive. So that was how it came in. So the answer to how this had happened was there all along, but, but we, hadn't, we hadn't paid a close enough attention to what she'd said in, in the affidavit. So rejecting her testimony because of that turns out to be false. We also discovered in a 1974 magazine two paragraphs it related specifically to this story. It was Lydia Schleppi's son actually telling a reporter about what his mother had, had seen and done back in 1947. So the origin of the story we can now show came long before Jesse Marcel said anything to Stan Friedman and long before the Roswell case sort of exploded in the air. So we have some very nice early information that was not tainted by all the stuff that came afterwards. So that's one of the things that's happened, and we've, we've now sort of revitalized the Lydia Schleppi story, and it becomes much more important because of that. Kevin, stand by. You and I have to take a two-minute commercial break. Dr. Kevin Randall is our special guest, www.kevinrandall.blogspot.com. If you'd like to give us a call and ask uh, Kevin any questions pertaining to UFOs, pertaining to Roswell, Give me a call now at one eight seven seven five two eight eight two five five. It's toll free throughout the U.S., Canada, Alaska, and Hawaii at one eight seven seven five two eight eight two five five. My name's Rob McConnell, and this is the Exxon, a place where people dare to believe and dare to be heard Monday through Friday from 10 p.m. Eastern until 2 a.m. Eastern, right here live and around the world on the Talk Star Radio Network. I'm going to let you in on a little bit of a secret that's uh, out there. Watch for this website, www.thexzonenation.com. More on that as we get closer to the launch date. I'll be back in two minutes with Kevin Randall right here on Talkstar. She's come undone. She didn't know what she was headed for. And when I found what she was headed for, it was too late. She's come undone. Kevin Randall is our special guest, www.kevinrandall.blogspot.com. Kevin, I was watching a, a documentary earlier tonight on uh, the History Channel, and it was pertaining to Roswell. And um, they brought up the fact that the Air, Air Force tried to convince people, including the mass media, that the, uh, the so-called 
crash was actually Project Mogul. It had nothing to do with aliens. And um, d does that wash, Kevin, in your books? Not really, no. And, here, and here's why. Project Mogul, the purpose of it was highly classified, and, and the people working on it didn't really know what that purpose was. But, but the equipment they were using, the fact they were launching balloons in New Mexico, launching arrays of balloons in New Mexico, was not classified. And in fact, two or three days after the newspaper reported the crash in Roswell, other newspapers showed Project Mogul arrays being launched from Alamogordo. So when they try to tell us that this, they try to imply, I guess, that the equipment was highly classified and the guys at Roswell wouldn't recognize it, it, it it's not true. It was just regular weather balloons. It was regular radar detectors. And Charles Moore, who was one of the people on Project Mogul, told me in an interview that they had gone to Roswell to try to enlist the aid of the, uh, the people at Roswell in tracking their balloons. So they went to Roswell and told them about the balloons before they even began to launch them. And, and they also were required by the forerunner of the FAA to put out a notum, which is a notice to airmen saying they were launching these arrays of balloons because they could become a hazard to navigation. Mm -hmm. So when the Air Force says, well, it was a highly classified project, of course we wanted to protect it, that's really kind of a misdirection because the equipment was not classified, the fact that we're launching them in New Mexico was not classified, the purpose to put some kind of a balloon in the atmosphere that could monitor Soviet attempts at um, exploding atomic bombs, that was very highly classified. And, of course, the Project Mogul went away as spy planes and later satellite uh, surveillance was developed. So it, it's kind of a misdirection on the part of the Air Force. And even if it had been highly classified, the balloons, when they were seen, would have been recognized by the people who were there. Sheridan Cavett, who was a counterintelligence agent at Roswell, supposedly accompanied Jesse Marcel out to the field, said that when he saw the balloons, the debris, he recognized it immediately as balloons, but he doesn't explain why he didn't tell Marcel what it was, didn't tell Blanchard what it was, until so he put out a press release that they had a flying saucer. Absolutely preposterous explanation. Doesn't mean what fell at Roswell was extraterrestrial, just means the Project Mogul explanation simply does not work. I have a question that I'd like to ask you as as a as a uh, as a former member of the military. I know that you're still involved with the military, so maybe I used the wrong phrasing there, and I didn't mean to. Uh, meant no disrespect. As Jesse Marcel was on his way back to the Roswell base with the debris, he decided to go home and show his wife and his son. Is that what? A normal, or is that normal procedure for a person in the um, in the um, responsible position that Jesse Marcel was in as an intelligence officer to stop off at home, wake up your wife and your child, and show them evidence? I, I think what we have to look at is back in 1947, in July of 1947, when this took place, mm -hmm. there was all sorts of speculation in the newspaper about what the flying saucers were. A lot of discussion about flying saucers in the newspaper after Ken Arnold's sighting in, in June, just about two weeks before this. Were they Soviet? Were they, were they some kind of experimental aircraft? Was it something else? And, and, and a few discussions about it being interplanetary. They didn't think in terms of interstellar, thought in terms of interplanetary. So they, they find this debris out there. Nothing's been classified as far as Jesse Marcel Sr. is concerned. But he's found something that is extraordinary, and he wants to share this, not so much with his wife, but really with his son. And but so he, 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 he took it home and let them see what was going on, because there was no pro, prohibition against him doing that at that specific moment. Had it been 36 hours later, he, there would have been that prohibition against him going home, and then he would have followed those procedures. But when he... The, the timing of the event is such that, that he took it home because he wanted his son to see this extraordinary thing. Why does it seem that all the really good UFO cases are from the 1940s and 1950s? Well, it, it, that, that's something that Carl Flock and I actually discussed a couple of times. And, and it seems that... Uh, 